Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for being here today. As you can see, I have Dr. Alex B. from the Office of Public Health, uh, who will have some information for you and be available for your questions. Uh, we shifted to a press briefing today because we have uh, also shifted our UCG meetings to twice weekly. Those will be held on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and so that's when we plan to have our uh, press briefings uh, going forward as well until we make some additional changes. And we will not have one tomorrow. Uh, we, we've been having them on Wednesday, but we'll, the next one is scheduled for Thursday. Uh, today, we are reporting 1,737 new cases of COVID-19. This is 96,538, I'm sorry, 583 total uh, since the beginning. That is 2.08% of our population. That is number two in the country per capita uh, for cases. And it is extremely close to number one, which remains New York State, but they're at 2.1% of, of their population. We're also reporting 36 additional people have very unfortunately passed away in Louisiana because of COVID-19. Uh, that number is the most uh, in a single day since May the 28th. That brings the total number of deaths uh, from COVID-19 to 3,498. 1,527 individuals are hospitalized. Uh, that is the largest number since May the 3rd. 186 of those are on mechanical ventilators. Um, with respect to chests, uh, in the month of July, we have now exceeded 374,000 tests. Our monthly testing goal, which is a minimum goal, is 200,000. Uh, we are just about uh, at twice that number already, um, and it's the 21st of July. So we're, we're certainly doing a lot of testing in Louisiana. That's a good thing. I'm never going to say we're testing as much as we would like, because we'd always like to test more. Uh, we still work on things like getting the turnaround time from the labs reduced and, and that sort of thing. But uh, our testing effort, I think you'll find, is, uh, is at the top of the country in per capita tests, and especially for uh, the increase in testing in, in the month of July. Uh, overall, we've done uh, more than 1.1 million tests in the state of Louisiana since the beginning of the public health emergency. Speaking of tests, uh, at the test surge sites uh, that we have set up, uh, as of yesterday, we've tested more than 33,000 uh, Louisianans uh, since the start of that surge testing. Uh, and this is testing that was brought to Louisiana um, to be testing above the baseline in order to uh, extinguish what the White House Coronavirus Task Force, Dr. Burks, Dr. Dror, considered a, a hotspot of national concern. Um, and there are five main sites uh, in the East Baton Rouge Parish area, four of those in East Baton Rouge, and that's F.G. Clark at Southern, Alex Box at LSU, Cortana Mall uh, in um, Baton Rouge here, obviously, Healing Place Church, and then Ascension uh, Parish at Lamar Dixon. Uh, there are also a number of mobile testing sites that are part of that surge testing uh, effort around the capital region and elsewhere in South Louisiana. Um, some mobile sites will operate multiple days, like at Cajun Field in, in Lafayette. And today we're adding a fixed site in Alexandria at the Repeats Coliseum uh, as part of this surge testing effort. Uh, this effort is, is going to be is short term, but we now believe it will, they will be open through um, the end of July. It's until we, we uh, exhaust all the tests that have been made available to us from the federal government for this effort. We think it will take us through the end of July. Uh, it is not necessary to pre-register, but if you want to pre-register, you can. You go to um, do I need a COVID-19 test.com uh, to pre-register. Remember, it's no cost to the individual. Uh, you can test because you have symptoms or, or because you've been in contact with someone who has COVID-19 or if you're totally asymptomatic and just are concerned that you might have it. Uh, you can uh, be tested. Apparently, some people are getting emails saying that they need to retest after they've received the result from these uh, surge testing sites. 
Uh, this occurs because people will register more than once, but they only test once. And so as the system tries to reconcile that, it'll send a notice out to the individual to come back and be tested. However, they don't, once they get a result, they don't need uh, to go back and be tested. But what I, we are asking people to do, if you choose to pre-register, only register once. Uh, because you'll be confusing the system uh, if you register more than one time. Community spread is still a major problem in, in Louisiana. Uh, we are seeing high incidences of COVID-19 all across our state uh, as defined by the CDC of uh, more than 100 tests per 100,000 population uh, over cases, I should say, not tests, over a 14-day uh, period. We're also seeing positivity factors well in excess of 10% uh, across the state of Louisiana. About a third of the tests that are coming in positive any given day recently are coming from those who are 29 years old and under. And somewhere around 90% of the tests today were from the community, only 10% or 9% or something like that was from a uh, congregate setting, just to let you know a little bit more about uh, what we're seeing. Uh, I would uh, take the, the, I don't know if we're going to a different graphic now or not, but as of the 15th of July, all regions of our state had a seven day average uh, percent positivity of greater than 10%. The most recent is 15.46% uh, positive. My biggest concern are hospitalizations per capita over the last 14 days. They are in an upward trajectory in all regions of the state of Louisiana. Uh, this is a particular concern uh, because we know that there are only so many beds, there's only so many nurses and doctors and so forth, uh, and the ability to provide life-saving care is critically uh, important. And again, that's true for COVID patients, but it's also true for all patients, whether they have a stroke or a heart attack or motor vehicle accident, um, that sort of thing. As of uh, the 16th of July, all regions are showing a downward trajectory in average incidences of cases. Uh, we believe, and you're going to hear f more from uh, Dr. Biu in just a minute, that this more likely than not represents a lag in the receipt of, of, uh, of test results uh, over the last week. And that as those test results come back, uh, you're going to see the, those incidence rates go up. Uh, also, uh, all regions as of July 19th have and are not uh, the effective reproductive rate um, of greater, I'm sorry, yeah, greater than one, uh, indicating that COVID infections or requiring hospitalizations are in fact increasing across the state of Louisiana. So I'll share all that with you and to sum it up this way, we still have a lot of COVID-19 in Louisiana, more than we want, and it is widespread um, all across our state. This resurgence of, of COVID-19 doesn't look like it did back in March and April where it was concentrated in certain areas, uh, mostly the densely populated areas around Orleans and Jefferson Parish and later in Baton Rouge and up in Shreveport, but it is widespread across the state. Which is why I'm announcing today uh, that I will extend phase two order uh, for an additional two weeks. Uh, as you know, the current proclamation goes through this Friday. Uh, and uh, so on Thursday, I will sign a new proclamation that will become effective Friday that will extend us in phase two uh, for an additional uh, two weeks. That'll be until Friday, August the 7th. We will continue to look deeply into the data uh, over the next um, uh, few weeks uh, to figure out where we go uh, from here. Uh, and at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. BU to get a little deeper into some of the uh, information around tests and hospitalizations and so forth, and then I'll come back up. I would ask you that to the extent that you can, if you've got a question for um, Dr. B, you might want to ask it while he's up here, and then I'll, I'll come back at the end, make some additional comments, and then I'll take your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Um, so, so just to reiterate some of what uh, was just said and, and what you can see up here on our uh, slide of our, our gating criteria, um, what we're seeing is really a statewide um, uh, issue at this point with COVID. 
Uh, we've talked about regions at different times, and when we first, if we go back to, to May, when we first started sharing uh, getting criteria, you know, we had specific regions that were uh, maybe not going in the right direction, and even then, uh, it wasn't necessarily all criterion, uh, or criteria rather, that weren't going in the right direction. Um, so you might have a region that was having increased cases or cases in hospitalizations, um, but, but not really seeing almost all three of them uh, going up at the same time. Right now we're in a different situation where we're just seeing a tremendous amount of COVID and a tremendous amount of spread of COVID across the state. As the governor noted, um, you can see that, that first uh, graph uh, in the upper right-hand corner. Um, uh, sorry, yeah, the upper left-hand corner, sorry. Uh, that, that is showing even the people showing up to emergency departments with symptoms of COVID um, are increasing. Um, in some regions, steadily increasing. Uh, as you're seeing here statewide, it increased and is staying um, elevated. Uh, compared to other reasons people are coming to emergency departments. If you look down then at the, the graph below that, you see that our testing has increased dramatically over time. And initially, there was a decrease in those yellow bars showing the percent positivity to where we got as a state below 10%. And now we've been steadily climbing, uh, surpassing 10%. And as you heard from the governor, uh, most recently at 15.46% uh, as of the 15th of July. Um, and, and that's higher than we want to be and shows that we're not just um, uh, seeing changes in testing, what we're seeing are real changes in uh, the number of people who are being found positive having COVID when they're tested. Uh, and then that's reflected in the uh, graph uh, of, our, of our new cases, uh, yes, in the upper uh, right-hand corner. Uh, did I reverse that again? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so, so as you see the red bars there increasing, especially as we get closer uh, in time, um, and then at the very end, turning green. Green meaning that we're seeing a decrease in incidence. But again, as the governor noted, um, when you uh, have a delay in test results coming back, as we're seeing now, where some people are waiting uh, seven days, uh, 10 days, we've even heard as much as 14 days for test results to come back, that period of time um, when we can rely on those uh, test results uh, coming back and that, that true incidence um, is pushed back further. So what that makes me concerned about is that in the coming days, those green lines are going to be filled in and become red, and we'll see that steadily across the state we continue to see increased numbers. And again, our daily uh, case counts would, would indicate that. In the last week, we had been seeing routinely numbers uh, north of 2,000. Um, uh, yesterday, we had, uh, if you just look at, at, at new cases, not those backlog cases, uh, a little over 1,500. Today, 1,700. So these are, these are high levels of daily cases to be reporting. And so I think we'll continue to see that incidence is high. But most concerning to me, and I, I believe to the, to the governor um, and me, to many of you, is the last graph, which shows what's going on with hospitalizations, where we've uh, now clearly turned a corner in the wrong direction and are steadily seeing a rise in cases uh, in hospitalizations uh, statewide, where we're seeing more people being admitted um, with COVID um, across the state. Uh, and I just had a call earlier today uh, with members of LDH and the uh, uh, medical leadership from across the state, the hospitals across the state, and everybody emphasized their same concern that they're seeing hospital capacities um, uh, becoming more and more strained, not just because of COVID, but certainly with COVID driving uh, a fair bit of new admissions, but also people who delayed care uh, because of concerns of COVID uh, now coming in uh, sicker and needing admission to the hospital because whether it's their heart failure or their breathing difficulties, um, those things are now requiring them to be admitted. And so when you have two reasons for people to be coming to the hospital and be admitted, it puts a lot of strain on those systems. Along those lines, I'd like to look at two specific regions. So we'll start with Region 4. Region 4 shows a very similar pattern to what I just showed you at the state level. Again, elevated COVID-like illness. You see that's a really uh, high uh, level of COVID-like illness that we had been seeing recently. Uh, testing, though increased, still shows high levels of percent positivity, positivity those yellow uh, bars. Um, and then uh, cases that certainly had been uh, on the upswing, and again, I have every reason to believe that we'll continue to see those fill out over time and be uh, elevated. Um, but most concerning there is the hospital uh, pattern in, in Region uh, 4. So that's the, the Greater Lafayette re area. And what you're seeing is that the level of hospitalization is nearly double. It's really exceeding what they saw in that first um, uh, wave of, of hospital admissions that we saw uh, back in March and April. Um, and now we're starting to hit a point where uh, several hospitals are having difficulties uh, admitting patients and seeing patients uh, in their emergency departments and are having to send them uh, to, to neighboring hospitals, and sometimes uh, patients are having to be shifted uh, to other regions where there's more capacity. If we look at Region 5, we see the same uh, pattern again. 
A lot of people showing up to the emergency department with symptoms of COVID that's translating into a higher level of percent positivity, translating into, again, high, uh, a very steep spike in the number of cases, more recently sort of flattening and maybe decreasing. We'll see if that, if that uh, stays steady. Uh, but with hospitalizations taking a sharp incline and again being around double um, what had been seen uh, in the previous epidemic. Um, and so in addition to um, uh, staying in phase two, we also very much uh, uh, support the measures uh, that the governor took uh, Monday a week ago um, in putting in place a, a mandatory uh, masking uh, mandate for, for the uh, state. As you heard, uh, we're now in a situation where every parish across the state has more than 100,000 or more than 100 cases per 100,000 in the last two weeks, um, which was the threshold for that mandatory masking uh, mandate, um, but also importantly shutting down uh, potential uh, hot spots of, of transmission like bars um, and, and, most, uh, you know, and, and reducing uh, crowd gatherings. Um, most importantly, communicating to uh, all of you the power that you have uh, to help us uh, stop uh, the spread of COVID uh, by wearing your mask and being very thoughtful about where you're spending your time and how much time you're spending around uh, others outdoors. Again, would strongly encourage you to, uh, even if you're wearing a mask, limit your exposure to people um, in under six feet uh, uh, distance uh, and certainly be wearing a mask um, uh, anywhere you go. Uh, so we're hopeful that with those measures, uh, we'll begin to see, you know, in a week's time, uh, a leveling off of, of our cases uh, and hopefully see some, some decreased pressure on our health systems. In the meantime, we continue to meet with our uh, hospital system leadership to talk about the steps that we can take in collaboration and with help with the federal government uh, to ensure that we're able to open capacity, we're able to have adequate staff uh, and address um, uh, what we're seeing uh, showing up uh, uh, in, our, in our hospitals across the state. Uh, so with that, I I'm happy to take uh, any questions that you have. Please. Well, it's more than clear that with the governor, you also extending the mask slash bar that order as well, too? Yes, sir. I think from our perspective, we are still very much looking on a daily basis at, at, at all sorts of information. What we're seeing from, from the CDC, because um, we still don't have definitive guidance from the CDC at a national level on what should be done for schools. Uh, but importantly, as with any guidance that we've received, whether it's from the CDC, the White House, or anybody else, we have to look at the context of what's going on in our state. So it would be a very different situation if we see that we're starting uh, to have um, uh, cases decrease, that we're starting to see the measures that were taken a week ago have impact versus things are continuing to, to um, uh, stay uh, bad or worsening. Uh, so I think that it's, it's too early to, to say from my perspective what our recommendation will be. Um, but again, we look at the data every day. Well, so, so the recommendation on, on when to actually move forward with, with schools, I think, will be one that, that's had with, with the governor, with the Department of Education, and certainly with local education leadership. What I'll say to prepare for that, though, is all the work that we've been doing now for over, over several months, actually, with uh, school leadership, with the Department of Education to plan so that we know what would be the things that we would put in place if schools were to open, should leave it really down to what is the timing that schools open. We know that local leadership is also concerning or considering uh, that data as well, but we want to make sure is that what school would look like, um, that and those planning uh, phases, that's all been uh, uh, completed and continues to be uh, revised and, and revisited. When that actual trigger is pulled for actually uh, reopening the schools is, is one that I think has to be based on what's going on on the ground. Yes, I'll say right now we are regularly in communication with hospital leadership and they are dialing in um, uh, capacity depending on, on where they are and, and what they're seeing as far as admissions, especially those procedures that will result in an intensive care unit stay, even if it's just you know, an expectation that after surgery you might spend a day recovering in the, in the intensive care unit. Um, we're seeing some hospitals defer those surgeries if they're not necessary um, and really try to reduce um, uh, those elective procedures. Keep in mind, 
another, you know, quote unquote sort of elective um, uh, visit would be uh, going to see your outpatient doctor uh, for your blood pressure elevation. So if they can do that, if they have capacity to do that, we want people to be getting the regular maintenance uh, care because that is going to be a core thing that's going to reduce some of the strain on the hospitals. Somebody who's getting outpatient care for their congestive heart failure is somebody who's not going to get admitted to the hospital and need potentially a, a, either a medical surgical bed or um, an intensive care unit bed. So right now we are sharing information uh, on a regular basis back with hospital leadership. We're in regular dialogue with them uh, and helping them do what they do best, which is uh, dial in um, uh, their ability to maintain operations and, and keep the populations that they serve safe. So for the 30 day month, are still hospitals on regular basis making decisions? Yeah, so right now the hospital leadership are making, making those decisions uh, with our, our support and, and certainly uh, we, we have not seen any decisions uh, that we're aware of that, that we wouldn't support at this point. Yeah, I mean, I think if there's any sort of uh, benefit to being in the position we are now, it's that unlike maybe many of our neighbors, we've been through this before. So we have a, a, a variety of different tools that we are ready to reactivate, uh, and some of which, again, hospital leadership are already activating individually because they have experience. So like you say, you know, there's, there's bringing, um, bringing in staffing contracts. Uh, from other parts of the country that aren't uh, as affected. In our neighborhood, certainly, most states in the Sun Belt are affected. And so we're seeing that the ability to have neighboring states uh, shift their staff probably uh, is not going to be available to us. But we're in regular communication with federal government. Um, we've been uh, elevating requests uh, for additional staff to the federal government, and we're hopeful um, that when needed, uh, we could have that support um, as well. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a nuanced question or, or a nuanced answer. I think uh, nobody wants to uh, hurt education and impact uh, education. It's really critical for our students that they get back to learning. Um, uh, we know that this is going to be a challenging school year regardless. Um, uh, and so we don't want to do anything that's going to make that more challenging. Uh, we also know that it's not a minor decision uh, to just switch from virtual to in-person. Uh, gearing up for in-person, having to switch last minute to virtual, or um, making sure that everybody by you know, two weeks' time is ready for virtual learning. So I think uh, what we've been doing is having broad-ranging discussions uh, with the Department of Education. The Department of Education, I'm sure, in turn, has been having broad-ranging discussions with schools to make sure that they are doing parallel contingency planning uh, and preparation so that whatever the situation is in their particular region, um, you know, they're able to, to um, uh, provide some sort of education and continuity for, for students. But uh, to my knowledge, at least in the Office of Public Health, we don't have uh, a, a switch where we're dictating when, when schools start or not. We're trying to provide information to the governor and the Department of Education that they're providing to local leadership. Um, on the subject of, of hospital capacity, do you know what the situation is at the convention center in New Orleans at this point? And are y'all considering either trying to um, expand that facility out more or do facilities like that sort of service facility in other parts of the state where you're seeing these problems? So we, uh, we still have capacity at the, the Morial Convention Center, the medical monitoring station there. Um, we, you know how much? off the top of my head, I don't have those numbers. Uh, but the governor can answer those for you. Maybe, maybe he can give you sort of the, the, the broader strategy as well, but what I'll say is we're looking at a variety of different opportunities. Keep in mind, the medical monitoring station is really for people uh, to decompress the hospitals when they're reaching capacity, less so for new acute patients. Um, and so that, that uh, weighs into uh, thinking about what hospitals need to do. If they're seeing lots of new acute patients and not yet having a decompression issue, uh, we need to make sure that they're uh, adequately staffed and supported to expand their capacity in the hospital versus expanding medical, medical monitoring where um, they're just having people that are, are staying uh, in the hospital longer. One thing that's different now versus the beginning is we've learned a lot about how to care for COVID. We have new uh, treatments, remdesivir, dexamethasone, convalescent plasma, certainly in our urban centers. Uh, and again, would encourage the public, uh, if you have recovered from uh, COVID-19, to uh, consider donating your plasma. 
um, uh, because that will help the next uh, group of folks. But so that changes the length of stay for people in the hospital, how acute they are when they show up in the hospital, then we're still at a relatively low level of people uh, requiring mechanical ventilation. Um, so so uh, how we respond this time uh, may be a little bit uh, different, um, but we do uh, still have significant capacity at the medical monitoring station. Uh, and whether that needs to be duplicated somewhere else, I think would, would depend a lot on the, the reality on the ground in those regions. Um, so the materials uh, may be slightly different depending on the way that that particular site is being supplied. I'll tell you that we are using a standardized protocol across those sites. And so even if the swab seems to be slightly different in, in diameter, um, everything has been validated. Uh, so it, it's probably just a matter of, you know, when you're talking about trying to do 5,000 tests a day or such a large volume, uh, that you're having to use a variety of different um, uh, swab types at, at different sites. As far as, you know, the experience of the individual, uh, you know, it may be that one person counts out loud, the other person's counting in their head. I, I can't speak to, to that, but I can tell you that we're using a uniform uh, procedure. And by and large, again, uh, these, are, these are guards people who are doing uh, this work. And, and one thing that they do really um, fantastically is, uh, you know, drill and, and, and perform protocols together. So uh, you may have a slightly different experience based on who is the person that you're with, but the protocol um, is, is uniform. And the place where they're being, uh, the samples are being tested is, is uniform as well. Maybe I'll take the last, yeah. I'm sure you explained this and I just didn't get it, but as far as I know, school is planning to open for in-person learning for schools and colleges in a couple weeks or within a month. In your medical opinion, is it safe for those children and teachers uh, to go? So uh, that's, that's not a question about when they, they open it. Is, it. is it safe for schools to operate in general? And, and you know, there's just not an easy answer to that. When we look at kids, um, we think that by and large, children, though they certainly can get COVID just like anybody else, they're at lower risks for, for poor outcomes uh, from COVID. You know, we're seeing a, a surge in individuals in the younger age group right now, and we're not seeing as many um, uh, of them get as sick as if they were 60 years or older, but we're still seeing even though uh, they're, they're generally healthier, uh, even those individuals are going to the hospital more often now because there's just so many more of them. Statistically, if you double the size of that population, even if it's a small number of that population that um, uh, needs to be hospitalized, you're going to double that population too, right? So what we don't want to see, um, even though kids are at lower risk, is a large number of kids that suddenly have more health problems because uh, of exposure to COVID. But by and large, kids are probably safe. The challenge, as you noted, is uh, you know, they have to be around teachers. Um, and they go home uh, to, to uh, caregivers, uh, adult caregivers. Some of sometimes uh, that's exposure to um, uh, people who are over the age of 60. And so all of that has to be balanced. Well, how do we operate school in a way that it reduces the likelihood uh, that any one student, were they to become, uh, you know, uh, have COVID, uh, would spread it to other students? Uh, how do we ensure that the, the, the teachers uh, are kept as safe as possible? Uh, how do we reduce the likelihood um, that, uh, that we have poor outcomes as a, as a result of this. And so medically, there's no easy answer to say, yes, you have school, no, you don't have school. What we can say is education is critical. We need to be able to, to do this work, whether it's in person or, or um, uh, virtual. And what we need to do from a public health standpoint is give advice on how to reduce the risk uh, to the public as much as possible. And with that, I'll turn it back to the governor. Thank you, Dr. Bu. And I'm sure all of you will recall that when the um, Board of Elementary and Secondary Education, it was just a little over a week ago, I guess it was not quite a week ago maybe, uh, they came up with their guidelines for our school districts. They did it based on a variety of contingencies, uh, primarily whether we're going to be in phase one, phase two, phase three, when they open and how those schools would operate if the phase changes, whether it in goes up or down. Um, and so they worked on guidelines. And so at the end of the day, uh, school will, will open and, and whatever phase we're in, that's how schools are going to operate. And you have uh, school districts now making the decision as to exactly when they're going to open. 
uh, for instruction, whether when they open initially, that is for in-person instruction, or whether that comes later. Um, I think you're starting to see where some school districts are going to uh, open on time, but perhaps for distance learning and then transition to in-person education right after Labor Day and, and so forth. So you're going to see um, a, a variety of approaches uh, by our school districts with respect to, to uh, how they open uh, and when they open for in-person instruction uh, and so forth. Um, but I will tell you that the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education Superintendent Brumley uh, coordinated uh, all of their planning with the Office of Public Health, with the CDC guidelines to make sure that we're doing things as safely as we uh, possibly can, which is why they included, uh, by the way, uh, as part of the guidelines, a mask mandate. Uh, Dr. Redfield, the head of the CDC, said on the White House uh, Task Force telephone conference week before last, that where you are going to open schools in states like Louisiana, where you still have uh, more COVID than we would like to have, uh, that mask usage is incredibly important. He, he talked about uniform, um, I'm sorry, universal uh, mask usage. Uh, that's reflected if you take a look at the, the plans, um, that the guidelines, I should say, that came out of Bessie. Uh, with respect to um, staffing, I, I think there was a question about staffing. A uh, week before last, uh, I participated in a call with uh, 18 to 20 hospital CEOs and medical directors. Uh, they identified three primary concerns um, that were uh, almost uniform across the, the state. Uh, they dealt with making sure they had adequate access to remdesivir, uh, making sure that, that the testing uh, turnaround times uh, could be decreased if possible. Uh, and thirdly, it was about staffing. Um, and so we started uh, talking to uh, those hospitals that were raising the staffing issues at that time. Uh, and when the vice president was here last week, uh, we raised that issue with him. I will tell you, we have submitted uh, through FEMA requests for um, medical personnel of various types, uh, ICU nurses, other nurses, doctors, and, and uh, respiratory therapists, and so forth. Uh, though that request is pending. Uh, we are also looking at other options like uh, contracting uh, with uh, medical uh, vendors, if you will, to bring in uh, staffing uh, here in the state. And, and so it's, not, uh, it's, it's a difficult thing to do because the medical professionals are needed where they are. Uh, and with the, the, the need being so acute and widespread, it's hard to get them into uh, Louisiana, but, but we are working various uh, angles to try to make sure uh, that if we can, we can provide staffing uh, relief for, for these hospitals. With respect to the Morial Convention Center, I know there was a question about that. Uh, right now, it is set up with 250 beds. Uh, there is staffing on hand. Uh, so that if 60 of those beds are occupied by patients, uh, we have adequate staff. Uh, we do have the ability uh, with a, within a very short time period to provide uh, additional staffing through a contract that we have with the vendor for an additional 60 beds for 120. Uh, today at the Morial Convention Center, we have more than 20 uh, inpatients. And, and again, these are the less acute patients. These are the ones who don't require an ICU, they don't require a ventilator, but they're not well enough to go home. Uh, and so the goal here is to keep them out of our hospitals uh, in order to free up the capacity uh, for, for the hospitals. So that's where we're at with the Morial uh, Convention Center. Uh, and, uh, and I apologize if I wasn't uh, as uh, clear as I intended to be when I indicated that we would stay in phase two where we are for another uh, two weeks. That is uh, going to include the changes that we made uh, that became effective last Monday with respect to the mask mandate, the bar closures um, for uh, on-premises consumption of alcohol. You know, they still have the, the um, uh, ability to do um, drive-through if they have that and curbside pickup. Um, at, at the bars, but also the limitation to 50 on the on the gathering, social gathering, uh, uh, the number of individuals who, who can do that. So that will all stay part of the order. We will go another two weeks. Uh, really, one week is not enough time, as you know, be, to determine the success or not of, of uh, various mitigation measures because it takes longer than that. Once the behavior changes, 
uh, occurs, it takes some period of time before that shows up, hopefully, um, in decreased tests and, and so forth. So we're going to go another two weeks and see where we are. The good news is that there's modeling recently uh, that's been done by the White House Coronavirus Task Force, and Dr. Burks uh, mentioned this last week to us several times, um, where we don't have to go back to phase one or to phase zero in order to flatten the curve again and see fewer cases, fewer hospitalizations, and obviously, ultimately, fewer deaths. We can get to a uh, R naught of less than one uh, if we will uh, wear a mask. Everybody wear a mask. That, that's why we have a mandate. And in fact, one of the things that she said was when you have a widespread high incidence uh, of, of COVID like we do in Louisiana, when you have positivity exceeding 10 in the overwhelming majority of your parishes, only a centralized state uh, mandate uh, will work. But in addition to that, uh, based on all the evidence, you do have to close the bars, and that nobody wants to do that uh, because we know that that visits hardship on, on uh, bar owners and, and other employees of bars, but it, but it is essential if you're going to uh, get um, the, the curve flattened again. And then finally, you have to decrease the, the crowd size, um, and, and that's why we're talking about social gatherings, no more than 50 people doing things outside when you can. Uh, staying uh, physically distant uh, from people, washing your hands, staying home when you're sick. All of these things continue to make a tremendous difference. And it also um, is still the case that you are safer at home than anywhere else. Uh, and so while we are in phase two and, and the stores are open and, and, and so forth, it doesn't mean that you have to go to the store every day. You know, and if, you would dec if everybody would decrease the number of times that they're out and about, uh, then they're also decreasing the likelihood uh, that they are going to become infected and then ultimately infect other people as well. Um, so obviously none of the decisions we've, been, we've made have been made lightly. They've all been based on the data, the best science that we have, and on the White House uh, guidelines. Um, we know that there are a lot of people uh, who are in need here in Louisiana and around the country. Uh, you know, one of the things that certainly caught my attention, and, and we knew that there was more need than we could initially fund, but the rental assistance program that we unveiled last week, um, we've identified $24 million to, to fund that initial effort, uh, and, and that's for about 7,500 people or so, but we had more than 40,000 uh, who signed up, not all of whom are going to be eligible. Um, but, but we had to obviously uh, stop taking additional applications, and then we're, we're working on funding uh, as the, the remainder of the need as best we can, uh, looking at uh, community development block grant funding and other ESG uh, allocations, which are forthcoming. The, the legislation um, that made those appropriations has already passed, uh, but HUD has not yet made the funding available. Uh, we, we know that they will and relatively soon, and because they're using criteria like uh, per capita case counts, Louisiana is one of those states that will be able uh, to take uh, advantage uh, of those programs. We are going to continue to look to other CARES Act funding, and then, of course, um, Congress is already talking about phase four legislation, and we don't know what that will entail. It's taken shape even as we speak, uh, but hopefully there will be some rental assistance uh, funding that becomes available uh, through that legislation as well. And I do encourage anyone who would like to receive notice about when those additional rental resources will become available to sign up at larenthelp.com, larenthelp.com. Uh, on the Frontline Worker Program, we have about 189,000 applications. Uh, there's funding available for 200,000 individuals. Um, Clearly not all 189,000 people who applied are going to be eligible, but we assume the vast majority of those will be. But there's still some room there uh, for people to apply. Um, I would point out that we have uh, paid out, uh, about two-thirds of this has been federal money, uh, but uh, $4.8 billion in unemployment uh, assistance. Uh, the, the unemployment compensation, the pandemic unemployment assistance, and so forth. Uh, and everyone 
realizes that the $600 weekly benefit is set to expire uh, on July 31st. One of the things that Congress is talking about uh, right now in phase four is whether to extend that, and if so, uh, in what amount of weekly uh, benefit. And I know that, that the uncertainty on top of the difficult uh, situation that people are in uh, causes a tremendous amount of anxiety, and I am aware of that. Uh, we're going to continue to work as hard as we can to make available all of the assistance uh, that we can get our, our hands on. Uh, we did see um, a drop in unemployment in Louisiana. We're thankful for that. Uh, dropped to 9.7 percent. It dropped by four and a half points. Uh, but there's still an awful lot of unemployed people. We know that. And that's especially true when you consider where we were in terms of our employment numbers before uh, the pandemic. But I want to stress again, the best, fastest, surest way to get more businesses open, more employees back to work, is to flatten the curve and, and get a handle on this virus as best we can and get the, the cases and the hospitalizations uh, trending uh, in the right direction. Uh, and at great risk of sounding like a broken record, we have to do the things we've been talking about all along. You got to wear your mask. You got to social distance. You got to wash your hands frequently. Stay home uh, when you're sick. Uh, we know it works. Uh, we've done it before and we can do it again. I have tremendous confidence in, in the people of Louisiana that we're going to get uh, back on, on top of this. Um, I'm going to take questions here in just a moment, but unfortunately there is a tropical disturbance that we need to talk about for just a moment. It is located on the north side of Cuba. Uh, it's expected to move into the southeastern Gulf of Mexico later today. Uh, has a 40% chance of further development over the next five days. Current tracks take that system, that disturbance towards Texas. Um, however, uh, even with the current trajectory uh, or tracking that we anticipate, southeastern Louisiana could begin to experience wind and heavy rain starting on Wednesday. And as weather experts always warn, don't get locked in on the forecast cone because the impacts can be felt outside the cone. And the cone is only right a certain percentage of the time. And sometimes that storm will move entirely outside of the cone. So please stay tuned for updates um, as, as the, the track and the, the strength of this system may change. Uh, and if you haven't done so already, please visit getagameplan.org to make sure that your family is prepared. And if you've grown accustomed to getting a game plan uh, and you've just done what you've always done this year, Understand that because of COVID-19, your game plan needs to be a little different. Uh, and so go to getagameplan.org uh, and it will share with you information that you need to take into consideration, uh, supplies that you need to have available that, that you didn't have to have uh, in previous years. Finally, I'll remind people that yesterday um, I invited uh, folks around the state uh, who were like-minded uh, to engage in uh, prayer and fasting, uh, the, the fasting dur during the lunch hour, and that continued today. And, and of course, I'm asking people to do that uh, tomorrow as well. Uh, so it's three days of prayer and fasting for our state, and particularly for uh, the COVID-19 uh, public health emergency, uh, for those individuals who are sick, that they will be healed, uh, for the caretakers, that they will have the grace and the courage and the stamina uh, to continue to do the heroic work that they've been doing for family members of those uh, who've, who've died, that they will find comfort and peace and that the state as a whole uh, will, will come together um, and, and understand that the virus is the enemy. We're, we are not one another's uh, enemy here uh, in, in this particular situation. So with that, I'm gonna pause and take your questions. Yes, sir. Attorney General have had great differences over the past week about your about these orders. Is he still participating or his designee in the United Command Group meeting? Uh, the Unified Command Group meeting, yeah, yes. Uh, the UCG meetings, he is he is not, uh, to my knowledge. Uh, the, there is an individual from the uh, AG's office on all of our calls. They they get an opportunity to brief, and certainly they get an opportunity. Uh, to listen to the daily updates that it relates to testing and cases and deaths and hospitalizations, uh, positivity factors and, and high incidence, all of those sorts of things. 
but he has not uh, personally participated, to my knowledge. He may be listening on the other end of the call, but he's not participated. Yes, sir. Yeah, and, and I think they've been looking at those options all along, trying to get the mix right and figuring out uh, how many students they want on, on campus and how many to do distance learning and, and, and what the, the hybrid situation would be where students engage in some in-person instruction and some by distance, and then certainly when to start that. Um, and, and so you've got all these school systems out there working extremely hard. They're consulting the guidelines uh, that they were given uh, by uh, the Bessie Board. Uh, and the emergency rule we got promulgated uh, last week, and they're going to make decisions uh, that are that are in their best interest, and we're going to try to work with them and 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 resource them as best we can, whether it's uh, PPE, uh, additional information, um, you name it. Uh, but but obviously uh, this is a very difficult uh, task that they have. Uh, we we've not been through anything quite like this before. Uh, and our school districts are learning from one another and we're learning from other states uh, and so forth. Uh, obviously the goal uh, is to safely get kids back in the classroom uh, to the maximum degree that we can. Um, and you've got to balance, just like we're balancing public health with, um, with the economy, you also have to strike the right balance between public health and, and the education. Uh, of our kids, and that's what we are trying to do using science, using the best uh, uh, information we could get from the CDC and, and, and so forth, and, and that's what we're trying to do uh, with, with our schools. And, and, you know, I will tell you, I've had a number of conversations with Superintendent Brumley, uh, and, and he and I continue to be impressed with the degree to which uh, uh, the effort, I should say, that our school districts are making in order to be able to do this safely. And, and I think it's, it's only natural that if you've got high incidence rates, high positivity uh, of, of uh, test results across the state of Louisiana, you are gonna see some school districts elect to do some uh, more virtual early on, start the in-person a little bit later, and that's flexibility that they all have. And we're gonna, I think we're over the next several days, uh, we're gonna see a number of school districts make make those types of decisions and announcements. Yes, sir. No, no, and, and look, we, I'll go back to, to what I said earlier. Um, the, the Bessie board came up with guidelines based on whatever phase we, of reopening we are in uh, when school resumes and, and how that school is going to operate for the remainder of the year depending on what phase we are in at any given time. Um, and, and so there's a broad range of contingencies there uh, and, th th and it, it informs everything from how many kids can be on the bus at the same time to how many can be in an individual classroom at the same time and, and, and how uh, different school activities are going to function and so forth. Um, and, and so we're going to make the decisions here at the governor's office about what phase we can be in based on the gating criteria uh, that we've been asked to look at and we're going we're to make that announcement uh, as, as early as we possibly can and then the school districts are going to, to respond to that. Um, I, I will tell you that over the next uh, week or so, I intend to meet with a variety of, of stakeholders uh, in our school systems. Uh, in order to make sure that I'm receiving their feedback and as they develop additional concerns or whatever that they can share those those with me. Um, th th this is not an easy situation for for any uh, part of, of the state of Louisiana and I guess that's especially uh, true for education as we get closer to, to resuming uh, the schools in the next school year. Yes ma'am. Well, schools have to be prepared to open 
in whatever phase we're going to be in. Um, I cannot tell you today where the state is going to be three weeks from now, four weeks from now, five weeks, because it's going to be dependent on the data that we get between now and then. What I can tell you, if people will do what we're asking them to do and wear their mask and socially distance and wash their hands and home when they're sick, we know that we're going we're gonna to bend the curve again and we're going to be in, in better shape. But I don't know what that looks like on a, cert, a date certain that, that's out in the future, which is why the, the schools uh, did what they did and they came up with, with uh, uh, guidelines that, that deal with each phase of reopening. Uh, so if, if I were a school superintendent right now, knowing that we are pausing in phase two for the second time, uh, and it's only a few weeks before school starts, I would probably start working. Most, uh, uh, most of my concerted effort would be to start school in phase two. But I cannot guarantee we're going to be in phase two then because, because I just don't know what the data uh, is going to be like. It is my hope. Uh, and quite frankly, it's my expectation that we don't go backwards. But we will do what is required to make sure that we don't exceed our capacity to deliver life-saving care in our hospitals. Yes, sir. There were a number of recommendations from the White House that were not included in the current executive order closing gyms, cleaning sanitizing yeah. pens, reopening schools, and things of that nature. Now that we've had a chance Well, first of all, the, the, the biggest part of the recommendations uh, or things that I did before the White House officially revised the guidelines, although they were telling us uh, that we needed to do the mask mandates, uh, the close the bars and, and so forth. Um, I, I will tell you, and we're, we're looking to get further clarification on this, um, our, for example, uh, whether to be at 25 percent in occupancy in our restaurants or 50 percent. We say it's up to 50%, but you've got to be able to socially distance with those who are not part of your immediate household. So, so we believe that the modeling that says 25% is really based on the ability to social distance, which is part of our current um, uh, restriction at, at, at 50%. So we don't feel the need, unless we get further information, to change from 50% to 25%, because either way, we are requiring uh, restaurants to ensure that, that people are adequately uh, social distancing. Uh, I don't know and, 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 uh, whether we've had any contact tracing that suggests uh, gyms are an issue and, and, and perhaps perhaps we have, but it's not. Uh, yeah, so, so it's, 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 not, it's not something that we've experienced as being a problem here, unlike bars, uh, which were the, the number one uh, um, venue where outbreaks occurred and the total number of cases was, was by far the highest were traced to bars, even though, and, and, and this is why the, what the White House was saying is correct and Dr. Burks is correct. That's true even though bars were completely closed down in phase zero and phase one. They only opened when we got to phase two and they're still driving more of the outbreaks and the cases that we can trace back uh, through contact tracing than any other, any other venue. So that's, that's why we're, we're keeping uh, the restrictions we've already put into place and the mitigation measures that we added this past Monday. Going to give it two more weeks to, to see where we are. Uh, and look, if we continue to learn uh, things that suggest that we need to take additional measures or that we can ease restrictions in, on certain venues, we're, we're going to do that as well. We're, we're working as hard as we can um, and as transparently as we can to use the data, use the guidelines to strike the right balance uh, here in Louisiana. Uh, well, I'll do two more. Uh, I, I have done this, but I will also ask you. So you didn't like his answer? <laughs> <laughs> well, he kind of punted a little bit to you on this one, which is um, in terms of the additional health care facilities like the convention center, mm -hmm. is that something you are considering or I am doing in any other parts of the state of trying to set up some temporary facilities because of the hospital? Well, we everything is under consideration, uh, but we would have tremendous difficulty staffing new facilities that are that are uh, constructed that are created outside of existing footprints of our hospitals, um, and and so that's not our 
our first effort. Uh, one of the things that, that uh, I, I'm really happy we, we made this decision several months ago is a number of hospitals around the state of Louisiana created additional capacity uh, for surge beds and ICU beds uh, that is permanent. And it, it greatly exceeds what it was. And, and, and um, I don't have the figure um, here uh, at my fingertip, but I think it's on the order of like 350 beds around the state of Louisiana uh, that are in existence today that, that didn't exist before. Uh, and, and that's going to help us. Uh, secondly, at LCMC, they have a couple of hundred beds uh, that are, are not ICU beds, but they put them in a negative pressure environment so that they can be quickly transitioned to ICU beds. But we're still going to have to figure out the staffing. But staffing is inherently easier within existing hospital footprint. Um, and, and, you know, for, for example, one of the things that, that could happen, I think there was a, a reference earlier to the Navy medical personnel who came uh, to Baton Rouge, to the uh, Mid-City campus of Baton Rouge General, um, and they, they operated a COVID-19 hospital there. Uh, we may ultimately have to stand that hospital back up, but without the Navy personnel, and so we're going to be working with all of the hospitals in Region 2 uh, to figure out what sort of staffing we can get from existing um, hospitals. Um, and so it, it, there's, nothing, there's nothing easy about this, but it's just much easier to surge in an existing footprint than it is to stand up uh, outside facilities when staffing is is the challenge. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, and it, it well it does because I I view it as a mandate. And by the way. I believe it's recommended for children younger than that to, to do it as well, but, but without a mandate. And we'll see whether, uh, whether that uh, is possible. And, and, and obviously, the younger a child is, uh, the, the more difficult it is to get him or her to keep the mask on and wear it appropriately and so forth. Uh, but I was, this is obviously anecdotal, I was watching uh, CNN the other night and they were interviewing a kindergarten teacher. Uh, I think it was in North Carolina, who had welcomed her students back, uh, she thought there was no way her students would wear a mask. Uh, but she said once she went through it with them one time, um, they, they did it, and, and it, it hasn't, hasn't been a, a problem. So I mean, we, we, will, we will see. But it, when, when you look at what Dr. Redfield said uh, about universal use of masks uh, in school settings, uh, I think that the guidance that came from Bessie is is exactly right. I interpret it as as a mandate for those individuals who don't have some medical condition that, that uh, makes it where they, they shouldn't wear a mask. So we're going to have another press conference on Thursday. Uh, we'll plan it at 2.30. Uh, we'll have another UCG meeting uh, on Thursday as well. I want to thank you for continuing to cover this. Uh, I want to ask the people of Louisiana to be as resolute as we were back in March and April. Uh, we can flatten this curve again. Uh, we, we've done it before. Uh, we can do it again. Uh, I have complete confidence, but it is going to take all of us. We all have a role to play, and so I'm asking you to, to play that role uh, so that we can keep as much of our economy open as possible, so that we can have as much normalcy as possible, and that includes uh, our higher education campuses and our K-12 through campuses as well. But there is no doubt we have a long way to go. Uh, and the situation is very serious, especially as it relates to hospitalizations. Uh, and so we, we really need to see those uh, numbers go down, the, the curve uh, start to flatten. And, and we owe it to one another to be a good neighbor. And we should certainly want to be a good neighbor, not just to the individuals who might contract the virus, but to the healthcare workers who have been working so hard uh, for so long uh, to the life-saving health care across the state of Louisiana. And we can do this. And finally, I just in invite everybody again uh, to, to offer up in prayer, uh, uh, you know, petitions that we would come together, that we would meet the moment. Uh, and, and I would encourage you, if you're, if you're able to do so and inclined to do so, 
uh, to join me in lunch fasting again on tomorrow. So we'll see you on Thursday. Thank you.